about current affairs in economy. This topic is framed in two very important aspects. Brexit, which is uh, something that we all have heard, and also the silk route. We probably do not know what this is all about, so we will ask our dear friend Francisco Javier Navarrete Gonzalez to present these two topics. I'm going to give a brief presentation of his backgrounds. Business administration, graduate in Mexico, master degree in foreign affairs by Nantes, France. Also postgraduate studies in Getulio Vargas, Brazil, and many other specialized courses. Mario, how are logistics teams? Let's close the door. So those that uh, want to hear this uh, talk are inside. His experience is quite wide. He has been in the diplomatic area for many years. He was many years in the Mexico Embassy in Paris, trade advisor and other positions. He was also in Brazil embassy in the trade area. He was also hired by the American states organizations to give training courses. And he has also held positions in Banco Mex, the fishing ministry and the Bank of Mexico. He was also a member of negotiating team for the GATT agreement. has many other activities. And he's also chairman of Canacintra Commission. He has also been related to Agro Mundo and also teaching experience in the Mexican University, Ever American, Pan American Universities in Mexico. He speaks three languages, French, Portuguese, English, and Spanish. So. We give the floor to Javier. It's an honor for us to have this important talk. Thank you. After this presentation, we will try to do things properly. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to talk a topic which is quite interesting the famous silk path or route. And then we would talk about Brexit, consequences, and why Brexit happened. I will break the protocol. I like to talk to friends as if we were having a coffee. So please be kind and let's talk. Let's talk about each one of the slides that I present. So if you have any comment, if I have the information, it would be a pleasure for me to exchange this information. And let's make this meeting more pleasant. I will thank Mauricio, my friend, the invitation of this event with so important characters in this for, forum, sorry, and to make it more dynamic, let's start. The topic that we're going to talk about will be the silk path. Why the silk path was created, what's its importance. The Silk Route dates back to 2000, 2,200 years ago. It was born in the Wang Dynasty. Back then, there was interest by the Asian countries to look for access route to trade all their products among them, mainly silk, but in their uh, back and forth 
trips, what they basically did was to exchange products. The new Silk Route was the best change response. Why? Uh, sorry, they are not using the microphone. We cannot hear from the translation booth. I'm talking about the uh, trade effect. Why the Silk Route existed? Sorry, can you ask him to use the microphone? We were talking about trade as such. As I said, 2000, 2,200 years ago. Back then, I think that we're talking about the times of Romans, Egyptians, probably the Mediterranean market. They needed to surround Africa. I do not know how they did it, probably by land. 1,000 years after that, animal and all conquerors walked, seeking how to make best trade route. We're talking about the year 2000 of our era. But if we think about this nowadays, why is so important? Why the great importance of this route? Simply, what's the United States doing right now? As it was mentioned, when we talk about the famous TPP, 12 countries, a high percentage of involved countries uh, trade that some 40% of world trade. But at the same time, the United States is seeking for a treaty with the European Union. And in this context, China is not present. Why? Because of a simple reason. It is a strong commercial and economic competitor for the United States. So the United States decides to isolate them from this situation. What we seek with the TPP and the transatlantic, the TIPP, well, obviously, to strengthen the economy and the trade of the U.S. Well, here, this talk is about that in, in, within this context, China, what it's seeking is, among other things, is not only have it as a great priority to expand its political, economic, geopolitical uh, strategy. So wants to incorporate certain countries that have been neglected or marginalized by, in the case of the European Union, that for more than 20 years have not, uh, has not accepted Turkey in, in the group, even though uh, uh, Turkey has tried for seven times during more than 20 years. And this, while well, they have been uh, looking for uh, other countries, the Turk the Kyrgyz came to our continent, wanted to have a participation with Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. in the, the North Trade Agreement. And they say, like the three countries said, why I would be interested in you if you are so far. We want to have a win-win situation. So therefore, those three countries have not uh, 
NAFTA neglected Turkey. So what we want to have with this to group both those three continents, but to have something that is substantial, well, the fastness, economy, time, and the displacing of merchandises from China to Europe. I think there was one person from Spain here in the room while well, he left. Okay, I just wanted to make this comment. Well, we will see in the World Atlas how the integration that resulted from this. To, so to deliver a merchandise instead of four, in 45 days, to deliver it in only two days. What does that mean? Efficiency, savings in costs, and the so-called useful time to get the product at the right time. So this concept of the time delivery on time means is one of the new measurement uh, parameters, the best product, the best quality, the best price. But it turns out that when are you going to deliver it to me? Well, I, I have to phone Mexico, and they will tell me how long it will take me to produce it, how long it will take it to bring it into China. Well, I think two months more or less. Well, it's usefulness. Well, I'm not interested in you as a vendor. So the Chinese right now, what they are doing is like to want to have in their ports or in their warehouse products. When are you going to deliver it? Two days? Yes, of course. You're in two days. You will have it. So I marry uh, with you, commercially speaking. So all business are working under a different scheme. I'm sorry, they're not using the microphone. So, how do you do this in two days? No, no, no. In, this is not in all the countries, but in many countries that goes overseas, it is very significant. We will see, well, in by plane, what, what happens if we send them by airplane? I give you two days. It's going to be impossible to comply with these two days. Yes, but the cost is really high, isn't it? By plane, it's very expensive. So therefore, or you send it by ship, it is. It it take many. It takes many days. You cannot say uh, send it through a railroad. The other one takes more, uh, longer time. But you are off the negotiation uh, structure. Well, what is the main part? Uh, as you, as accountant, already know, the logistic part. When. You do not integrate yourself to a logistic concept. You have losses in terms of warehouse cost, transportation cost, and most often sanctions, contract cancellations, and, and or loss of the customer. So to seek efficiency of manual uploads and wearing costs by reducing indirect costs. In the customs, sometimes it takes us like four or six days to get the product here. So there are, well, within this project, there's the idea very well rooted that in the first stage, the Chinese government has uh, considered $1.4 billion to invest in the first stage of this project. What is, what is this stage? Is to align or to uh, overlap all the railroads, because from one country the measurements uh, change, five centimeters to 10 centimeters, whatever, but they need like to match all those measurements. They have to standardize all the railroad systems, so they will invest $1.4 billion to uh, homologate the railroads, but for 
all the cost, the total cost of this project, they have considered, they have just signed an agreement with Iran of $135 billion. $140 billion. This is one of the works, construction works, that we are going through. There's a new change, political, economic change uh, worldwide. So it says to re rehabilitate the railroad system for high-speed trains to deliver products to tens of cities. I don't know if you know at least the work done by the Pekin to Lasha. Well, this is a place where it was almost impossible to reach. It was in the Himalayan mountains. It is a monumental work. They spent almost $2.5 billion to, to connect this uh, railroad. It is a huge work that it was so difficult to conceptualize. Let us imagine that those trains are pressurized because they go up near 5,000 above sea level. So it is like going by airplane, more or less. And they have carried out this work in which it was planned to be delivered at a certain point in time, two or three year time, but they were mistaken. And they, but the mistake was in favor. They delivered the work eight or nine months before the set time. Like it happens in Mexico, exactly the same. We promised that we will be delivering it in two or three years, but we deliver it in four or five years. We have the example of the bid carried out for the new refineries. Uh, from the beginning of the Calderon administration, it was uh, one of the first bits carried out. At the end of his administration, uh, well, the bit was only for the fence, the fence, not not for the structure, the infrastructure of the refinery. Only the bit was made for the fence. So we should see that we are almost like them in terms of this uh, functionality. So this is a response to a geopolitical and geoeconomical vision what, that is clear from China and in particular by Xi Jinping president. And this comes from the previous Hu Jintang president who was the precursor of those ideas. Well, this leads us to China, as you all know, is the country that has or that has had a sustained growth up to 11 percent. Now the Chinese are suffering because they have a growth of 7.5 percent. It, it has serious pro, uh, problems in its production, and and when those productions are reduced and they are not placed in foreign markets, because we know of the situation going on of the re, the rest of the countries, this has made China that to produce more, but there's no market, so they keep the merchandises. I don't know if you know if you would be so kind to tell me what do you think is the earning margin of the Chinese people? The ones that they produce this in 100 pesos, how much they earn in producing this lighter? Well, the lighter, as a way of example, two or three percent, okay, two or three percent. More. Just give me an idea, just a guess. Okay, 9%. 1%. They, they gain between 2 and 3%. But what do the Chinese have as an advantage? Because they sell 20, 30, 40 million of these. If, if we add up the 3% uh, multiplied by 20 million times, it's profitable for their economy. Well, in Mexico, and uh, you as accountants, the owners of companies 
produce a, a, a product, they overcome their cost and they will put a 30% of earning. And why a 30% gain? Because I have to pay Social Security, I have to pay this or that. Or for less, I don't work. Well, but we sell 35,000 pence. And I, with a gain of 30 or 40%, they sell. If you go to the sub, uh, subway, our friends from Ecuador and Peru, friends, if you go to the subway, you can have three pence for 10 pesos. So you say, well, to bring them from China, the manufacturing costs, the raw material, the earnings, plus the customs, agents, and how many things we have to add? Three pence. You're getting three pence for 10 pesos. Each pen costs three pesos. And so this is what we need to change a little bit with, uh, on how we market. And this, at some point in time, is going to be a very important factor. Why? Because since we do not have so many indirect costs, you will have you will have your marketing plan in a in a better a certain way. Well, this is something that is important. It sounds like a, tra uh, a drama. The U.S. will continue controlling the sea routes that are used by China the most, and therefore we have to open others' uh, routes by land. Fifteen or out of the 20 most important ports are Chinese. So hold on. And where are the other ports? Well, in the other are like Rotterdam, like other ports of, uh, of like are very important. But what are the Chinese doing uh, with this uh, route of the silk consum? They are, are getting, they are owning like the so-called, uh, the they are own, own, owning the seas, like non-claimed seas, you all know, that according to the Vienna uh, agreements, they they reach like 200 miles from onshore, uh, offshore, onshore to offshore. Those, the, the, that's what the country owned, but there was like a big strip. Do you know what the Chinese are doing right now? They are building, building artificial islands in order to have the right to claim in the, in the international treatment, treaty. So I have an island, and you have to give me 200 miles. But those, those are islands that, that are not geographically uh, inhabitable. So what are they doing? They are, they are like having futuristic projects in which we need to seek for uh, uh, to be inserted in those mechanisms. What, what is the main part of, of, of this uh, Silk Route concept? Let us imagine it will apply to all of Asia, Gulf, uh, uh, countries of the Gulf, the of East, Middle East, and part of Africa and Europe. We have the widening of Suez uh, Canal. The same thing when Panama uh, Canal was uh, implemented because of the the magnitude of the ships, the dimensions of the ship, the so-called Panam, the new Panam, which is huge, didn't fit in the previous uh, Panama uh, Canal. So those infrastructures are made in order to improve and to have a more efficient trade between countries. So they will, they will, they will have opportunities to have. Uh, a great amount of products and bring them to countries that never uh, had access to before. So in this concept, 
What has happened? There were countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, and neighbors, when I say that those islands, uh, were so-called islands, were built there. So the Philippines have presented a proposal, submitted a proposal before Vienna to have their rights uh, valued. So since China has been established there, there are difficult disputes, disputes to conceptualize. So right now, this is a geopolitical situation that is very strategic in terms of countries. What else can I uh, tell you about this? This is important. The world population is around 7.3 billion people. With this concept, new this will affect positive